Hi, I'm John Broxton for the International Film Music Critics Association and I'm very pleased to be able to present the 2018 IFMCA Award for Best Original Score for an Animated Feature to Mark McKenzie for Max and Me. Thank you, Many John. congratulations. Thank you, John. Really, really appreciate this. I uh, just wanted to say a few words. Uh, one, I, uh, I want to thank the International Film Music Critics and um, who are people who actually listen to the music uh, in a way that uh, some of the awards shows uh, don't sit and listen to 400 scores a year like <laughs> some people I know. And so I'm very appreciative of that and all those uh, who have purchased the soundtrack or streamed it and so on. I just really appreciate people listening. And um, I, I want to also just acknowledge just a few people. One is um, I got a start. Um, I was just finished my doctorate and in music composition at USC and, and uh, was hired by Bruce Broughton. And Bruce uh, gave me a job, helped me pay back some of my school loans and uh, or started orchestrating for Bruce. And, um, and then that led to other composers. I, you know, I've orchestrated about 100 movies for people like Jerry Goldsmith and Danny Elfman and Mark Shaman and Alan Silvestri and John Williams and so on. And, um, and as you do that, you get stereotyped is that's who you are and what you are. And I have always along the side uh, had another passion, which was writing music, and so began early on writing music. But, I, but there are those who kind of have a vested interest sometimes of keeping orchestrators as orchestrators. And, and so partly why this is meaningful to me is to be acknowledged uh, as not a great orchestrator, but actually a reasonably decent composer. Uh, this was my second nomination for best score of the year. First being uh, the greatest miracle, greatest miracle, and then now Max and me, and I, and it means a great deal to me. Um, so I just want to say really a sincere thank you for that. And then also, um, the, um, you know, a score like Max and me just doesn't just happen. It's uh, it's a real big team effort. I, I want to acknowledge a few people. One is Pablo Barroso, who is the producer who allowed me to hire Joshua Bell and who really kind of had a vision to do something bigger. This is a very, very small animated film, but he had the vision to go to Abbey Road, and so we hired Joshua Bell to play solo violin, and uh, then we had the London Voices, we had 135 of London's finest musicians. And uh, so people like uh, Peter Cobbin, who recorded it, Armin Steiner, who mixed it, um, uh, Gordon Johnson, who, um, who conducted it, uh, Claudia Nemer, who helped produce it, and um, there's so many others. Mark Perlman, who edited it, um, and uh, performers like Clara Santabras, um, who is the vocalist that you hear, uh, Isaac uh, Thomas, uh, who is the voice soloist, and Robert Preisman, who directed the Libra Boys Car, which is a real kind of, I'm a big fan of Libra. Um, so I want to just acknowledge those folks. And then also one other person I want to acknowledge, which is uh, my high school choral director. His name is Robert Roberto. And over all these years, I would call Mr. Roberto. That's what I called him, Mr. Roberto. And I would cry in his shoulder. I'm orchestrating and I'm really, you know, I'm just doing really well as an orchestrator, but I just can't crack that nut right. as a composer. And he was like, Mark, your best days are ahead. Mark, you're, you know, this is going to happen for you. And so he has been, for now 30 years, a cheerleader on the side. And uh, he just passed away, but I was grateful that he heard Max and me, and I dedicated the music to him before he passed away. And he said to me, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not sure it really means a whole lot other than I just want to acknowledge him. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, teachers, we all have teachers, I right. think, yeah, uh, that are meaningful to us, and he was one of them. And then last but not least, just want to, uh, just want to acknowledge that the story itself is a very inspirational story about the Polish priest. Yep. And uh, it's filled with hope and, um, and peace and uh, unconditional sacrificial love. He, he sacrificed his life for someone at Auschwitz who had been chosen to be starved to death, and the guy cried out, don't, not me, 
you know, somebody else, right? right. <laughs> As we all would want to yes. yell at you. But I have children at home. And Colby thinking, you know, I have no children, um, so I'm expendable. Right. So he stepped forward and said, take me. And, and, and what, that, what was behind all of that is that Colby felt that the only way to impact darkness, the only way to impact the Nazi regime was to be compassionate right. in the midst of torture, in the midst of all the abuse. And so he showed kind of the ultimate sacrifice of love. And so grateful to, uh, to uh, Maximilian Colby. Okay, so thank you so much, John. Thank you. So, Mark, congratulations again on uh, winning for Max and me. Um, you mentioned in your acceptance speech um, about your early career working as an orchestrator for people like Bruce Broughton and so on. Um, and you, you touched on the, the differences between working as an orchestrator and then transitioning to a composer. Um, how, how difficult has that been? Because it's not a transition that many composers have actually made, starting out at that part of a career and then working as a composer later. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience has been like? Yeah, it, it's, it is very difficult. And um, we talked about uh, my friends Bill Ross and Conrad Pope, who yeah. are both really fine composers. Um, I'm guilty of this. I think we all are. We, we think of people, and once we've met them, uh, we're like, well, that's who that person is. And so I have orchestrated for a number of years, so people who make decisions think of me that way, and I have this huge, heavy weight of all these huge films, yeah. uh, from Dances with Wolves to Spider-Man to Men in Black, and you know, um, Good Will Hunting and Sleepless in Seattle, and you know, I mean, it just goes right. on, right? Yeah. So I can't ignore that. Of course. But at the same time, I have 20 smaller films, which no one except for a few people like you, <laughs> uh, and you know, music fans right. have listened to over the years and have responded to the music. Mm. And that's what kind of keeps composers like me and Conrad and those of us who are trying to make this. It's, it's fans who are like, I like this music. Right. Um, the films aren't doing really well, so it's very hard to convince um, Powers that be, uh, there is one agent in town who I just love, um, who uses the line, orchestrators don't make good composers, as, as a kind of uh, way of keeping all his orchestrators kind mm. of in line, that right? seems like a very narrow-minded attitude. Well, it, it ignores a lot of people. It yeah. ignores John Williams, who started out you know, arranging and yeah. orchestrating. It ignores Playing Henry Mancini. Mancini. It, right. uh, sorry? He was playing piano for Elmer Bernstein before he... Yeah, no, it, it ignores a lot of inconvenient people. Right. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, when you listen to the music of a lot of composers, uh, and I've had people say this about me, you know, I just don't respond to his music. It's like, um, I just don't find there's anything there. And, and, and mm. so I've had that experience where I've listened to composers mm. and, um, and not responded to it. Um, so but that's then, just a taste thing, surely. I mean, that's nothing actually to do with your compositional prowess. I mean, you would think that that would be more a matter of taste than... Yeah, it's a matter of taste. Well, I think also the fact that I studied with people like Milton Babbitt and, um, and uh, an incredible composer, Lord, uh, Morton Lauritsen, mm -hmm. um, Ludoslavsky. Right. I mean, I was, I was, I came through USC immersed in Stockhausen and in, in all of these uh, aleatory composers. And I found myself at the end of that. I mean, I finished my master's, finished my doctorate. And at the end of that, I just said to myself, I don't like any of this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so yeah. I had to kind of follow my bliss. And so on that, I ended up writing really kind of thematic, deeply emotional music. That's w what I respond to. Yeah. And so to take full responsibility, there's that aspect that, um, you know, there are filmmakers now who don't want emotional music um, and are afraid of themes. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, if you look at some of the big, big films, the themes, um, even, you know, Michael Giacchino and some of these guys who are working on the biggest films, right. the themes carry these films. And so themes 
um, I Pe think are really important. I work really hard on them. Yeah. People don't remember a drone. They remember a melody. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And, and there's a certain level of dumbness uh, to some of the music that's being written. Um, and, and yet I respect you know, those guys who are trying to kind of push boundaries. Um, so to get back to your initial question, it is a challenge uh, yeah. to, and, and then there are those who are like, well, I kind of like the score, but he hasn't done anything. And the right. agents who are sitting on the sidelines, um, they're not going, gee, you know, we love this, what you're writing. They'll, they'll write me notes and say, what you're doing is incredibly beautiful. But will they take me on? I mean, I'm talking about the agents who really are, are the main players in the business. Right. And they won't take you on until you've had a hit film. So that's what everybody hopes for. Is that's that a chicken and egg situation. It's I a mean, chicken and egg situation. Yeah. yeah. So, but you have to keep pounding the pavement. Right. So, uh, you know, I keep, uh, it's always built on relationships. Yeah. So my relationships up to this point have been with lots of uh, Lots of musicians, mm -hmm. uh, lots of composers, and um, and then building relationships with directors. It's a whole separate, you know, set of people. Okay. Yeah. So, so when you look back on your career, are there are there particular scores that stand out to you as something that you're especially proud of? Um, I mean, obviously, you and I have spoken previously about how I personally think Max and Me is a, is the best thing you've ever written. Um, but you know, as you, as your career has developed, are there particular milestones that you look at as being? The first score that I felt really good about, first two scores I did were these, yeah. these uh, horror S films. Son of Darkness. Yeah, Son of Darkness and Warlock. Warlock right. and, and I was asked to do three other horror films, and I turned them all down because I really didn't want to go down that direction, even though musically it's just so much fun. Mm. Um, so the first film that I felt really good about was uh, Frank and Jesse. Mm. And the music Frank and Jesse was played by some really fine musicians. Um, I'm trying to think who played the recorder on that, but uh, it just had so much heart. Yeah. So that one, and then also the disappearance of Garcia Lorca. Um, That's a favorite of mine. Is also a score that I that I felt like I'd kind of pushed myself. Yeah. Um, when I write, I I work you know 16 hours a day, seven days a week to make sure that every, every moment of my day can make the music as, as powerful and expressive as I can make it. Yeah. And I do all my orchestrations, so it, there's a certain amount of the day that just has to be taken up with the physical act of writing the notes down and, and orchestrating and so on. So um, then I think there was another movie that I liked a lot, which was The, the Lost Child. Yes. Lost Child is just really sweet and beautiful, and, and I remember my agent calling me up after that and going, and he said, why did you write that? Why did you do that? And, and he was implying, like, you wrote this beautiful music, and it's like, that's not hip. Right. But that's uh, what the film needs. But the film was filled with heart. Yeah. And so I just respectfully disagreed with him. <laughs> um, which, you know, you really have to kind of stake out your territory and stand your ground. Yeah. And so after that, then there was um, The Greatest Miracle, mm -hmm. which got, um, like, we had Libra and we had right. a big orchestra, and it was an opportunity, to, again, to write kind of big thematic yeah. music. And that sort of took on a life of its own afterwards. I mean, didn't, didn't you play that for the Pope? Or it was played for it the It was Pope? played for the Pope. Yeah. It was um, just... You know, it got a lot of attention, yeah. and um, and people responded to the music. Yeah, and it was again, it was a really tiny, tiny film. Right. So there is that. Let's see, and then you know, I've done these Dragonheart films, which have been um, a challenge in in a different way, kind of all electronic, right. which is a whole other beast. And I was going to say, I mean, how how do you find that being a you know a very traditionally trained classical orchestral composer? How do you translate that to working with? With electronics and synthesizers, does that change the way you write, or is it just yeah. uh, just no, changes it, the the medium of how it's performed? It does both. Right. It does both. And and so first of all, all the scores that I've composed are scores that um, I was just thinking of something else. All the scores I've composed, I've I've always mocked up everything electronically. So I'm immersed. In, I've been immersed in electronics for the last twenty five years. Right. So it's nothing new to me. 
but it's always a challenge. I, I'm constantly updating my, my sounds. I just bought an entire new string library. I bought a new one last year and the new right. one the year before. I'm always looking for something. But it always comes down to your ears and, and you have to trust what I know sounds great on the stage as an orchestrator yeah. all these years in front of the orchestra. Um, and sometimes, you know, you get, you get tired. And so I, I, on the first uh, Dragonheart film, I used too much reverb. And it was just something that helped me kind of get past all the electronics. Um, right. So I've learned to got to pull that back a little bit. It's, it's a challenge to kind of try to make it sound as realistic as possible. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, what was the other thing I was going to, what was your question again? The, um, yeah. Yeah, working with electronics, and then, but we're also talking about you know the different films that you've done over the years. I was going to mention your relationship with Hallmark too, which is a very ongoing thing that you've had through. I think Durango was Hallmark, and Lost Child was Hallmark. Durango yeah. uh, was the first film they hired me for, and I was sent into the office of the president, and he said, "I want you to write schmaltz, <laughs> and I don't want any bagpipes or any drums or any you know Irish instruments." Right. You got, I, there, <laughs> you got a fiddle in there, though. You got a fiddle in there. Yeah, <laughs> which I promptly, completely disobeyed. Right? Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I hired uh, the guy who played on Titanic, I, right. Eric uh, At Riggler. Riggler, thank yeah. you. And and I did what I thought was right. Yeah. And so the, the the fun thing about Durango is that it worked well in the film. I, I went to Prague, did a huge orchestral thing. They had never had anything like that done for a Hallmark film. Mm -hmm. And then it got played on the Academy Awards that year as under the in memoriam when uh, George C. Scott, you know. And, and so I get a call. Everybody at Hallmark's thrilled, right, that their music played on the Academy Awards. So yeah. I was really vindicated on that one. Right. Um, you know, another score that I, that I wanted to mention, too, is the, that has done really, really well is uh, Saving Sarah Kane. Mm. And it's, it's this film that has a piece in it called Prayer Changes Everything that plays nonstop on Pandora. Oh, really? And, uh, and, the, and the soundtrack just keeps selling. And, and it's because of, of this particular piece, and, and it's just kind of a gentle, meditative right. score. Right. That's half electronics too. I mean, it's half orchestra and half electronics. Yeah. Hmm. So let's talk a little bit about Max and Me. Um, obviously, you know that you've got this relationship with Dos Corys on his films, and one of the things I specifically wanted to ask you is, um, obviously, without getting into financial aspects, they clearly emphasize music in their films. You yeah. know, they wouldn't have given you the, the, the you know allowed you to hire Joshua Bell and Libera and go to London and I mean that must be really a refreshing change for someone to put that much emphasis on wanting great music in a film. That's Pablo Barroso mm. and uh, he's a man I have the greatest respect for. He hired me for The Greatest Miracle. They had, they had hired another composer who had written an entire score for the film that was primarily uh, a small kind of orchestra but than also electronics. Right. And it really didn't work. And so they called me and they, I was recommended, to, you know, and they, they met with me and, and I said, look, what you need to do is you need a big symphonic score for this film. Yeah. It's an animated film, but what it needs, it needs heart. It needs, it, it needs like, to, to really reach someone's spirit, in a sense, you do that through their emotions. Right. And so I said, the way to do that, and we need choir, and I have this relationship with Robert Prizman with the Libra Boys Choir, yeah. and I was trying to get them to think so much bigger than they could ever have fathomed, right? Right. And I said, that's what your film needs. Call me if that interests you. And they're like, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> right? <laughs> and you were expecting stuff to hear from them again. And I never expected to hear from them <laughs> again. And then they called me and they said, you know what? And I presented them with a budget where I could accomplish all of this yeah. at a very minimal cost compared to what it would have costed in, an, in other ways, uh, right. union and so on. And, uh, and they said, go ahead, we really want to do this. So then when I did The Greatest Miracle, uh, it impacted their film. Mm -hmm. I mean, the music became a big advertising tool for their film. Yeah. And, um, and people were responding uh, to the film, but 
you know, music's one of those things where people don't go, gee, you know, I saw this film and it made me feel like this. They just come out and say, you know, I like this film. Mm -hmm. And so, but everyone knew that the music was, was contributing. So then when Max and Me happened, oh, so, sorry, I'm, I'm a little ranting here, but, uh, <laughs> so then what happens, James Horner did their next movie. Right. Which, which was, was Christiata. Yeah. And James was going to go to London at Abbey Road. Yeah. And I was like, wait, I score mine, you know, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. James gets to go to. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, you know, I'd like to go to Abbey Road too. Who wouldn't? And, and, and so Pablo, who I love, he didn't respond, right? What? He just called me the next time that we're going to Abbey Road. That's right? Wonderful. And then it was kind of the discussion of like, well, you know, I would like to have a large orchestra. Mm. So we hired a huge orchestra. And then, uh, if you remember the movie My Week with Marilyn came out, mm. where uh, the pianist uh, Lang Lang yes. played. And it was, uh, you know, it was very effective in the film. And, and I suggested, uh, I had seen Joshua at a concert at the Hollywood Bowl. And I just think he's the most emotionally um, complex musician that I've heard. His phrasing um, makes more out of one note than any musician I know. And so I was suggesting that we might consider him. We got a price on what it would cost us. And Pablo, to his credit, you know, this is a small film. Yeah. He came up and made it happen. And so, um, I'm very grateful. Yeah, I mean, that, that's such a, a positive reflection on you that they were willing to invest so much in, in your, your work and your writing and your sound. I mean, that must be a gratifying feeling knowing that. Yeah, it is. Um, I think we're both on the same page. We both want to have that film impact the heart. And so he understands that that takes forces. Mm -hmm. And then he also does, he just believes in me. Yeah. And he's, he's willing to I mean, you know, in the, at the end of the day, though it's a huge number, um, these films last forever. Right. And if you do a synth score, it, will, it might get by for the first few years, but at some point, people are going to go, that is, I mean, it's dated. that is so dated. Yeah. And it's no longer really, it's no, really, no longer effective, right. you know, to the audience. Whereas an orchestra is always effective. It's timeless. Yeah, it's timeless. Yeah. Yeah. And they understand that. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Congratulations again. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah.